slido.com and then type in we are London, you can submit questions there. I promise I will at least check it once, maybe just once right now. The more and controversial, I, the better. Yeah, we will, we will check it, we promise. Um, so we've got our two speakers. We've also invited Ali from Go Carlos. I used to work with Ali at Capital One and I'm going to get her to introduce herself properly in a second. Um, but I wanted to make sure we had a good representative uh, from Go Carlos in the group, but also someone who I know can give us, um, I suppose, a really interesting perspective from a delivery team um, point of view and someone who um, supports that kind of delivery of security projects with engineers. On the ground, as it were. Um, so, Ali, I'm going to hand over to you to introduce yourself and I'm going to kick off with some questions. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, I'm Ali Wardrop. I work here at GoCardless um, and I did used to work with, with Tash uh, in a previous line. Um, so, my main focus is on delivery and helping engineers pick up security work. So, um, we have a security team here at GoCardless. Greg is uh, there as well, he's in the team. Um, and our priority is to make sure that we're building secure products uh, and that people can trust what we're doing. So I come from a very non-security background, so it's, um, it's an interesting thing to, to sort of talk about. And I feel like I'm sandwiched between two very experienced experts, so we'll see how I go with the questions. <laughs> Ace, thank you. So um, our original topic was, um, I don't know if anyone saw it in the meetup, I certainly did not share it with the speakers beforehand. Um, is how do we ensure security teams have a positive impact on product development? But actually, with the things that we've spoken about and the things that people have talked about as a break, I want to be really open to any question everyone has on any topic, including um, people's origin stories, um, security strategy, working in complex and diverse teams, and all of those. So you'll see a real mix of questions. Um, the first one that I'm going to ask, and I'm going to go off, off piece a little bit, but I want to just make sure we cover intros. Um, Nick, I'd be really interested in your origin story, as Jenny Radcliffe would put it. So those that listen to the People Hacker, she always asks people what their origin story is. I'd love to think that it's great, but see what yours. Um, but tell me, how did you get into security? And how did I get into security? I was a... <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was a system administrator, but always, always sort of interested in security. And then a friend and colleague was interested in, uh, and it was a, a security operations, which was called security operations by uh, basically admin firewalls. And one of the file administrators really wanted to be a pen tester instead, so he went off, got a pen testing job, and then told me all the highlights of pen testing. The highlights are great, the stories are really good, um, the things you've done, the places you go, the places you shouldn't be. He didn't tell me about how dull it was, all the travel, all the reporting. I see some learning smiles in the audience. So I was then a pen tester for 10, 15 years. I've then been uh, pre-sales support, I've been an auditor, I've been a trainer. So I've moved around a bit. Uh, I'm now trying to figure out what I am. I might want to be a cyber security strategist, except I'm not sure what it is, it sounds pretentious. But also, um, I think that's what the I think that's what the industry needs. So that's that's my story so far. The rest still needs to be written. So we're kind of like in the second act. Okay. Ali, yours. Um, mine is probably not one I should admit. I just got offered a job in security one day and went, yeah, I'll take it. <laughs> um, so I, I'm Australian originally, and I worked in um, project management, uh, and I moved over to to England because that was my dream. Uh, since I was nine and I got a job in a PMO, which wasn't what I was looking for, uh, and then a company called Vericode called me up and said, we've, we've got a position for a security program manager, do you, do you want to come along? And I thought, I'm desperate to leave the job I'm in, so yeah, I'll, I'll go for it. Um, turned up, everybody was so inspiring. There were ex-hackers, all of these people around me who were like doing stuff with my phone that I didn't even know it could do, and my mind was just blown. Um, so that, that sort of really pulled me into doing it and, and I really loved it ever since. I always feel like I'm on the back foot learning new stuff. Um, but that's what keeps it interesting, sort of meeting, meeting people uh, like I am tonight and just really learning because there's always new stuff to be, to be learning about. So that's my intro into security. <laughs> well, no, I think we've got all the origin stories there. <laughs> 
you, I mean, is that yours? Tasha, you want to roll with your first question? Or? Yeah, okay. So, um, I'm going to actually skip. Um, we've got one on Slido, which I'm going to cover in a second. Um, so, the first time, Chris, I, I made a connection I mentioned to you just now, um, I listened to a podcast called Diner Diaries. I highly recommend it for those who are just in it. Um, Chris actually features on the Stuxnet episode. I'm a huge Stuxnet nerd. Just to say, uh, it's episode, sorry to interrupt, just it's episode 30. If I had headphones with me, I would have listened to it all on the way down, so I'm looking forward to listening to the second half in the car. So we'd, I'm just glad that they are thinking about some money stage. It's, <laughs> it's, just, it's just a really good summary of what, it's, I'm expecting you talking on your behalf, it's a really good summary of what Chris has described off her origin and just what actually happened. And uh, yeah, and Darnick Dyrus is, is worth following anyway. Oh yeah, no, I loved it. The bit I, I guess I love was the fact that you got to a point in your career where someone rang you up in the were in an airport and they said, we need you. <laughs> yeah. um, and I guess my my question to the, the group is, is, it's hard sometimes to consider yourself an expert in the cybersecurity world. I consider myself a professional an expert is a high one, right? Because the, the landscape is continuously changing. How do you, this is a question that I need to jump in on, how do you keep up to date? What do you listen to? What do you learn from? What do you look to to keep up to date as well? <laughs> okay, so some of the things I do to keep up to date is whenever something new comes out, I spin up a lab. Uh, I don't have any hobbies. My main hobby is hacking. And I enjoy that hobby a lot. Uh, another thing that I do is I do some very specific training for various governments. And uh, that's a lot of fun because then you are putting it into action, so hands-on types of things. And then I also do uh, a few papers. And for example, I'll be at St. Andrews University in April uh, on a panel with uh, the current UK Air Marshal the U.S. Uh, uh, equivalent and two retired generals talking about air, space, and cyber strategy and presenting a paper called The Art of Cyber Warfare, uh, defending forward in the context of international law. So I try to always keep up to date. I read a lot of papers, I spin up labs, and I try to get my hands dirty as much as possible. Um, for me, I ask every stupid question that you can possibly think of. Um, I work with really intelligent people and I'm very lucky that I can be very honest. Um, I'm, I'm new to security relatively, I've been working in security for five years, I don't know everything, I'm not an expert. Um, and so I just ask every single question I can think of, I have to stab myself first. Um, and then I qualify those assumptions that I've made or things that I've learned. Greg, with all of the other engineers, um, they will all tell you that I send them Slack messages saying, what does this sentence mean? What does this mean? Can you send me some more information on this? Um, and everybody is so willing to help you if you sort of let them know that you're really keen to absorb that information. Um, so yeah, I just ask lots of questions and talk to people and read and, and sort of double click, as, as one of our executives say, on everything that I possibly can. Because I don't have that background, so I utilise the people around. Wow, those are a couple of good answers. Okay, those are a couple of good answers. Um, I follow up podcasts, follow up blogs, read a lot of things online. Also, I am not up to date. I do not keep up to date with everything. Um, unless this is literally all you do, and I have a lot of respect for people that apply to you, don't try and don't feel bad if you don't. Um, I think that's one of the things we need to get over in cybersecurity is that you need to know everything all the time. When actually it's known, to me it's more knowing the right people to ask. Like there's already a couple of things I should be asking Chris afterwards about talking to generals and cybersecurity strategy and so on, especially what I think is the awful idea of defending forward and things like that is immediately there's um, but I don't know all of that, but I know the right people in, I know some of the right people in the UK are literally to ask, and now I know Chris, so I can at least ask afterwards. I think that's the way to do it, and just do what you can. Um, also, something I did in the presentation, whether I want to or not, I have 10 different hobbies as well as this, so I can't stay up to date. 
but I think my interest in those different hobbies, I mean, my like some here, gives me a perspective that other people don't have. If that's the way you think, try it, see what it brings to the industry, use those analogies and metaphors. I'm going to let you ask the question, yeah. and then I'll go into sliding. I've had a really burning moment, and it, it surrounds kind of um, the real impact of what we're promoting here, which is kind of like diversity and getting people in. So it's a two part. One, the first part is what is the negative impact today by not having diverse teams? And the second part of the, of the question is if we did have more diverse teams, would that resolve? Breaches more quickly, would it resolve? Like, I think maybe you're a living, breathing example of how diversity can help because you know, you know, the passion and the power that you have to break through to do it. But what is the bottom line? Why are we here? So, I'll try to answer the first part and I remember the second part. <laughs> so, many of the uh, security teams that are around, they are a primary target when you're trying to get into environment and organization and so forth. And because I've known uh, several examples where they are an all-male team and then they get catfished with water and bullet attacks and a method from somebody named Stacy, um, this shows that you do need diversity because this probably would not happen to someone like a lady Chris or maybe a man Chris and vice versa. Right? So just if they had Chris to ask and say, this looks suspicious. Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, you also get a different perspective. Uh, one of the ladies who left during the break, I was telling her one of my best hires was actually a person with a background from history, which had nothing to do with technical uh, skills, but somebody who researched things and look at things from a very different perspective and be able to communicate those things. Uh, the second part, it was, why are we here? Oh, yeah, well, <laughs> basically, if we did have those diverse teams, what do you think the, the bottom line would be in terms of remediating breaches, finding vulnerabilities faster, would we be able to? Do, uh, and do you have any objective proof of it? So, <laughs> I, I had a fairly diverse team, including multiple languages, uh, that I set up at Ramco, and because we had differences, we had somebody who was a uh, uh, qualified auditor who could deal with certain issues. We had uh, pen testers who also worked in that environment. We had defenders working in that environment. We had people who were multilingual. So we had to uh, look at attacks because our threat profile was so high. Using 26 different languages within that team was uh, paramount to our success of being able to pick up on things. So we were able to uh, find things, do some very interesting stuff with like predictive analysis and different languages to be able to uh, see where our threats were and then try to quash them as quickly as possible. And without that diversity, both in the skill set and gender and ethnicity and language, then we would have been uh, in a world of hurt. Um, for me, I just sort of think, are I, I joined security because I, I was pulled into it um, and when I looked around I was surrounded by men um, which was fine. I, I don't really have much of a problem working with men. I found it really enjoyable. I've learned a lot. Um, but I think for me what, what we bring when we open, open things up and sort of hire people who are fit for the job as opposed to just because they fit a mold or, or whatever it is, is they start to challenge you on things and they I think it's quite easy particularly in an engineering environment to do things because that's just the way things have always been done and that was the code before and so we're just going to build off that um, and I think when you start to open up the pool people start to come with different experiences different questions and just a, a different way of thinking about things um, and I think I've been lucky enough to work in teams where we really encourage that and um, really challenge each other even if we agree with the principles, we challenge each other anyway, um, just to try and elevate and, and get that a little bit better. Um, and I think that's what a, a diverse environment brings. If you have cookie cutter kind of uh, teams, you end up with the same result. And I, I just don't think that generally benefits anything. Um, in terms of whether it's effective and whether it, it has all the right results, um, I think we can tell because we're still building that out. Um, I don't think we're at a place where we're super diverse um, in, in every respect, um, and I think we're still to see what that looks like, but I think things are improving from my very limited uh, 
career experience, um, and I, I just hope to see that. Continue. That's a really good question, <laughs> by the way. Um, for louder and more emotional versions of presentations I've given, no, I mean, we're in a game, we're in a conflict. It's better and more fun to win. So, for your first question, what's negative impact of not having diverse things, you will lose. That it's, it's that simple. You will be, uh, you have less time with a narrower set of strategies who will lose more often. And lose might be, you work out the weekend, lose might be your company doesn't exist anymore. Um, so that's the negative consequence. Two, from diversity. Um, Ali, um, regardless of anything else, is a project manager. That means a bunch of bunch of techies. She's learned methods of being organized, of prioritizing things, managing people, and so on. That's incredibly useful from a diversity perspective. Anyone, I mean, herding cats is such a common phrase in their industry. Professional cat herders are what, uh, 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 literally what we need. Um, as a proof, right now, no. Um, it's been really presumptuous and previous. If there's a chance to speak in here or Overwatch London, yes, because I have the URLs, I have the evidence. Uh, teams speak individuals. So teams working together are better than individuals. It's statistically proven in sport. Also, there's scientific proof as well. Also, it just generally makes sense. Um, if you get the best people, regardless of uh, race, creed, colour, gender, sexual preference, and so on, you just get better people, and then you have better people to work with with whatever strategy you use. Um, so it, it definitely makes a difference, and I think, although I don't have the URLs to hand, it, it's provable that it makes a difference. Yeah, I'd, li I'd like to see the proof, just to, just to have it at hand. Go, yeah. yeah, there you go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll sort something out like. <laughs> Just to hit people with it, but I love it. Yes. <laughs> I, I am going to add a and I, I apologize for everyone that's submitting questions on Slido. I'm going to do them slightly out of order because there is one that I think backs onto this really well. Um, before I read the question out, when we talk about diversity at OS, we, are, we mean so much more than gender. I know we're women in accent, but hopefully, as you see here, and some of you who know me will see that sometimes I use the hashtag or the phrase us in AppSec, not women in AppSec, which is it should feel like us, and we can be us, we can be ourselves, and that's what we want, it's an inclusive environment that helps give everyone the platform they need to speak from. But talking about that, sometimes when we hear people talk about diversity, whilst there's often the best intentions, we maybe see things that aren't quite the right approach, and the question that we've had submitted is, what about positive discrimination? And what do we think about that? And before I jump out to you guys, the first thing I want to say is it's about equal and having the right opportunity, and that's really important, and sometimes that means we go overboard to make sure that the opportunities are put in front of everyone, and that sometimes is a, a more intense or a specific effort to make sure that everyone has the right opportunity. That being said, we should, and this is my first opinion, and I hope this causes a little bit, right? Because that's the best type of panel. I would never want to get a role for anything other than the fact that I'm the best for it and I'm the right person for it. And I hope that every role I've ever gotten is, and that Maeve and Sonia that are in my team at the moment, so that's an I do, they have their roles because they were the very best they applied. They are absolutely wonderful at what they do. Not because of who they are or how they identify themselves to be, but because they are the best. And for me, I would always want to know that. That being said, sometimes I don't search for roles in the same way that people do, people do because I don't always think I'm good enough for it. So networking events and going to meetups are a good way for me to hear about these roles because I won't search for them because I won't always think I deserve them. So I do think there's a, there's a challenge in making things accessible and inclusive, but for me, I wouldn't ever want anyone to think they've just got a role because of what they look like or how they identify. But I'm, I don't know, I've already spoken a lot. And I'm supposed to just get hoped. <laughs> but I am interested in how you guys feel or think or observe positive discrimination in cybersecurity. So I have not gotten any of my jobs based on the fact I'm late. That's it. That's pretty clear. Uh, however, at the same time, I do agree with you that I would not want to uh, just get a job based on, on something like that. But uh, making things accessible and trying to give uh, people who might not think that they are able to do something a leg up and encourage them in. 
uh, is also, I wouldn't say quite so much positive discrimination, but trying to recognize when you've got certain strategies and certain needs and you need diversity, uh, trying to get them in, especially since uh, many times I uh, are talking about uh, working with a whole bunch of really cool people, uh, the learning curve suddenly just drops down uh, when you're surrounded by people that you can ask things with and so forth. Uh, so giving a leg up, so to speak, uh, I do believe in. Uh, but I personally would not hire somebody just based on a certain thing. But I would try to get my teams diverse where I need them to be, absolutely. Um, I guess I've just got a story about when I applied for a job, really. And it, it shocked me that this thing kind of happens. Um, the recruiter called me and said, so they've interviewed this guy and he's better than you, right? Like, he's just, be he's just better than your job. Um, so you just need to wow them with your personality. Um, and I just sort of said, this, this really doesn't make sense to me. Like, why, why, why am I doing this? Like, you, you've said he's, he's better than me. Surely he should, he should get the role. Um, and the guy was like, yeah, but you know, he's trying to diversity, you know. And I just went, I'm, I'm just not really interested. If, if he's better than me, he should get a job. And I, I went to the interview and I tried my best and, you know, went there. But I sort of made it quite clear that I wanted to win. I didn't, I didn't want to just kind of be the woman that won. Um, so yeah, I just think it's a, it's, it's a strange thing that happens. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm the same as Tasha, I just don't think that we should get a job because we fit these criteria. The criteria should be you can do the job and you can do it really well and you have the potential to improve. Um, those are things that I think are important, not, not the fact that I fit specific other things. Right, I'll take oh, yeah, this is a that's a good question, it's a big question. Uh, it's become a bit of a theme of this evening that my first answer is I don't know <laughs> because it's so difficult and also the the straight white male is the last person to ask. Like I think it should be asked but quite seriously, the last person the last kind of person to ask about the effect. But also, I think positive discrimination, as has been said before, looking where you wouldn't expect to find people and encouraging people you wouldn't expect. There's a great time I saw on Twitter describing groups as under index, as in you can't find those people. And I think the ideas and quality of female speakers, once conferences start to be called out for having all male presenting lines, all male panels, means we have better speakers. I realise there's also an effect on the role models one can get to see. Personally, I'm much more interested in getting better ideas, and we're all getting better ideas, because people were, made to, were forced to make an effort to find better people regardless of what they expected. And that's also true of employees. It's just you'll find better employees if you make more of an effort rather than you'll look all for the people who listen. Like, as you perhaps point out, I'm Lady Chris, are you sure this is what you want? Um, <laughs> that hopefully we get to say that that's no longer necessary. Because regardless of strategy and so on, we do need a uh, better quality of people and more of them. Love it. So I am, uh, despite asking you guys the longest first questions in a while, and because it turns out we are going to feed you. <laughs> but I want to ask you a few more questions there. So we're going to go through a couple of slides over and ask people in the room. I'm going to ask you guys to do one sentence and might let you do one and a half. Reply is really short and sweet. You don't have to answer every question, but I just want to give some people the chance to, to publicly ask those that want to publicly ask, and then I'll, I'll ask everyone. If we don't hit your question, it's not because we don't love it, um, but I will encourage you to directly approach the speakers. Over pizza. Over pizza. <laughs> <laughs> before, we do that, um, before I jump into Slido and a couple of one second responses, do we have anyone that wants to ask a question here? Um, otherwise, I'll go through Slido. I'll ask the question. Oh, Nick, does hacking back actually work? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is a one sentence answer. Yeah. <laughs> Short and sweet. I don't know. <laughs> something I would have said if I'd have had more time, comma, the Eindreff division 
the whole point is they retake their own trenches because they know them so well and the artillery is set up. Comma. That's where, that's where <laughs> hacking, back, hacking back works. I would argue against defending forward, but we'll do that later, full stop. Like, that's the use of the English language there. Okay, okay, next question. Uh, I don't know. How can we, how can security participate in risk management functions most effectively? And I'm going to combine that with another one, which is how can security help our risk teams and our risk owners <coughs> make the right decision for the company and it's the right time? Um, for me, it's just being at the table. Um, I think both partners has a really great set of values, and the first one is um, start with why. Um, and one of the great things that we've been able to do here is really prove that security definitely fits in with those risk structures. And so we've made a big effort to make sure that we sort of weave what we're doing in with what the rest of the business are doing, including risk, obviously. Um, and so I think getting people to buy into what you're doing um, and build those risk models with security being included as part of that journey um, probably been the most successful trust here, but that's quite difficult where you're going to fight an uphill battle with security. I think we've all familiar with how to try and convince people to get on board. Um, so yeah, that's double sentence. <laughs> <laughs> Security should enable business because most businesses are not in the business of security. And tell them what the risks are and having them sign up because security doesn't own anything. It's a business that owns things. And turning around on that method, that one's work for me. I saw this work at Demon like 20 years ago, semi-cold. <laughs> be, be approachable and friendly and other teams will talk to you. That's it. I like that, be approachable. Don't give a team of no, I think you said it. You're a side deck. And one of my kind of favorite questions to be submitted is, um, how can we learn from past mistakes when we work in such a dynamic environment? And this is specifically from a decision, decision support perspective. Which I really like. The one thing um, I guess I would take from it, just to just have what you guys think, also just one sentence, is just because it didn't work before doesn't mean it won't work in the future. And I, I say that because I've worked in teams with people that have been there for 15, 20 years and said, we tried that once, it doesn't work, maybe 15 years ago. And, and I always, especially in those environments, as a, especially early on in my career as a younger person coming in, I always felt like I was going to say, we should try this, we should try this, and they'd be like, no, 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 no. And I always felt like sometimes experience could be the enemy of itself in terms of putting you off of, of trying to do things. It's still important to learn from it, and as we hear from a military perspective, it's incredibly valuable, but sometimes I think it can make us too nervous to take risks. Build blameless post-mortems into your feedback process. Is it? <laughs> Chris? Well, uh, trying to look uh, at the perspective of this didn't work, but it can work because you have a, had a change in technology, uh, a change in risk appetite, a change in the business. So uh, I do agree with uh, you that uh, sometimes things can work in the future, uh, but just doing it differently. Uh, another thing is um, trying to uh, learn in a positive way and trying to guide things in a positive manner, especially when there's been, say, a big breach or uh, somebody trying to take out your oil company. Uh, maybe you shouldn't uh, encrypt uh, the system <laughs> that you can uh, reset your domain admin pass, uh, password, but it also means that uh, you have to make sure that people know that there is never going to be something that's absolutely riskless, uh, riskless as well. So uh, trying to incorporate that in. And finger blaming or finger pointing does not work, only works on his slides. <laughs> so I think, you know, um, really good points there, but also there are lots of things in the past that have happened that we haven't learned from already. And that's why OWASP is still going, that's why we're all here tonight. We haven't efficiently 
figured out how to address what has been happening for 25 years in terms of vulnerabilities in code. Um, and I think, yes, we can look forward and make things for the future, but we have to get the fundamentals right. And that's when you, you know, slide back to your OWASP top 10, go back to your basics, why the heck is SQL injection still a thing? Why the heck is cross-site scripting still a thing? You know, that's what keeps me in bread right now, you know, but that is a huge question and we need to learn from those as well. So, um, we're gonna, I'm going to combo two questions to our last question and I'm going to start with Kat and then work our way down <laughs> and then I'll let you guys eat pizza. That won't ask all of the questions that are in the slide or I'm sure the ones you have, but again, do speak to our speakers. I'm going to ask two, I'm going to ask what would be your one piece of advice that you've learned throughout your career that's done you good, like a, a phrase or a saying or just a, something that's resonated with you, that you do, that's done you good that you want to share? And then secondly, what's your call to action? If the audience can take away one thing or do one thing tomorrow, what would it be? Two really easy questions. Okay, my first, my first answer will be um, my favourite phrase, and this is going to sound really cryptic, is A1, A2, execute. If I go into something, I need to know what are the potential outcomes of my valuable time there. Um, so if I'm going in to solve something, or if I'm looking at something, I need to figure out outcome one, outcome two, and then the alternative of everything goes to crap. And um, this has been really successful for me and in my professional career because I've been focused on outcomes rather than on problems. And because we're in a solution-oriented vertical, I mean, or a section of the company. I think to focus on outcomes as much as possible and not get totally bogged down in, in, in the problems. Because you can, you, can, you can have lots of fun with them all day, but eventually you have to fix them. Let's see. Um, I, I think a kind of phrase that uh, has stuck with me is uh, always look up for opportunities but always look down to pull people up with you. Because that's one that stuck with me because um, then you show other people uh, what you can do, what you want to do, and you're always bringing people along the journey with you as well. Um, mine, because I work with delivery, is to lead, not manage. Um, so I think a lot of people come unstuck when they try to really sort of push things along and push their own agenda, you'll get much more buy-in if you try to, to sort of lead, lead the group and, and lead people to good outcomes as opposed to demanding. Right, one piece of advice is play to your strengths. It's really difficult to figure out what they are, I'm still doing it, but play to your strengths rather than trying to um, minimise your weaknesses in any job in the industry. If that's not working for you, you're in the wrong job, find something else. The call to action, rather preferably, would be somebody's waiting, uh, waiting, is network. It works in all industries, it especially works in this industry. Take that social risk even, talk to people, make a connection, ask questions that you think are silly but might open up someone's eyes to a different point of view. Uh, that would be my call to action. Love it. Mine is that uh, we're looking for speakers and people that want to write your face. Um, and people to eat pizza. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to our incredible speakers and panelists. Um, the last bit I leave you guys with is um, comparison is the thief of joy. When you hear people speak and when you see people's journeys, it's really easy to think about where you're at in your own place and where the people are moving. Um, you are your own person in your own point in time, and we are here to support and mentor and help you in any way we can. Please let us know how we can do that. And if we, we'd love to amplify your voice. So please speak, please write for us, um, please network and um, if you need help, um, any intros, we're more than happy to do that. Um, let us know how we can support you. Thank you so much for coming and thank you for staying here.